the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven will be as when a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I root, reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, the Creator, Liberator, and Sustainer of the universe. Amen. As we approach the end of the Christian year, there is always a danger that a preacher such as myself runs. And that is doing what I did last Sunday when I pointed out that for the next several Sundays, the theme of judgment would run through all of our lessons. The danger is that no one might come back the following Sundays because our culture does not like the theme of judgment very much. The late Danish theologian and philosopher Soren Kierkegaard once said that as he sat in the Lutheran cathedral in Copenhagen and heard gospels read that said such things as it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. That as he looked around at the congregation, he was always surprised that half the people didn't get up and walk out. So for those of you who were here last Sunday and were warned, I congratulate you for coming back this Sunday but that, that does not change the content of the lessons. All three of the lessons contain the theme of judgment. Prophet Zephaniah, who prophesied around 630 BCE, is very clear as he speaks to the people of Jerusalem. 
that they are engaged in a form of piety that is sheer hypocrisy, that they are trying, as many religious people tried in the day of Zephaniah, they were trying to substitute piety for ethics, and Zephaniah said it will never work. You cannot do it. If you, do, if you say one thing and do another, you are living a lie. He also pointed out to the good people that they were accumulating a great deal of silver and gold, and they believed that that would save them on Judgment Day. And he wanted to make it very clear that it would not. The people of his day did not like the theme of judgment any more than the people of our day and most of them did not listen. Writing to the church in Thessalonica, Paul says to the Christian community there that they need to wake up. That part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus the Christ is that you live awake. You live awake and in touch with the reality of your own time that you live awake and sober and engage your history. Now is not the time to fall asleep and pretend like you do not know what's going on or to walk around half awake and never really know because you simply don't care enough to know. Be awake, Paul says. Be awake. The 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, which is the last parable that Jesus teaches before he goes to Jerusalem to be crucified, we're given the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents involves a, a, a Roman estate owner who called his servants in and said to them, I'm going on a long journey and I'm going to leave with you various talents. He gives them no investment advice, and then he leaves. His expectation, his expectation is that these servants of his have worked with him long enough that they have learned from him. So he believes he doesn't have to say very much. It was also common in the Greco-Roman world for estate masters, and they had many servants. Doctors were servants, for example. They had many servants, and they would entrust what they had to the servants and go off. Now what is being entrusted to these three servants is quite a bit. A talent, we believe, in the day of Jesus, was equivalent to about one million dollars today. So it's quite a bit of money. And even the one who only gets one talent has quite a bit of money. It's very clear from the story that the master goes away and then he comes back and he evaluates. He judges what they've done. It's very clear that Matthew wants us to know that individually and collectively as a body, we have been given talents and that we have a responsibility in using those talents, that God will hold us accountable for the stewardship of the talents that we have been given individually and collectively. Again, I want to remind you that judgment in the Bible is not judgmentalism, that judgment in the, in the Bible very often, very often is an opportunity to hear the truth, face into the truth, and turn and move in a new direction. Judgment is often a sign of hope. Judgment can also 
be a statement about it is too late. And an uncle who smoked two packs of cigarettes a day for 40 or 50 years, the doctor kept telling him he was going to get lung cancer if he didn't stop. He was always going to stop. He always said he wanted to stop. He never stopped. And one day the doctor said, you have lung cancer and you will die shortly. It was too late then. It was too late then to stop. Sometimes the word of judgment is a word that says it's too late. But normally in the Bible, the word of judgment is a call to change what you are doing. The word of judgment comes early. Don't smoke those two packs of cigarettes and you won't get lung cancer. Turn and move in a different way. In the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, in the parable of the talents, this very wealthy state owner gives five talents to one servant and says, be faithful with these. Gives two talents to another servant and says, be faithful with these. Gives one talent to another servant and says, be faithful. He goes away. Then he comes back. And when he comes back, he calls them in. And he says to them, what have you done with the talents that I've given you? What have you done with the talents that I've given you? The first one steps forward and said, immediately when you left, I began to use my talents to create more talents, and I have doubled what you get. Master says, well done, good and faithful servant. You notice that in this case, there is a lot of joy attached to judgment. Judgment does not always have a negative implication. It can have joy. Good job, second servant. What did you do with the two talents I gave to you? I knew, Master, that you would want me to use them. So I also immediately began to think of ways to increase what you had given me. And I also have double what you gave me. And again, the judgment comes down. Well done, good and faithful servant. And there's joy. Then the third servant. Third servant's a very careful person. He didn't want to take any market risk. He just wanted to be cautious. He wanted to be prudent. Wanted to do the thing that was secure. So he says to the master, Master, I knew that you cared a great deal about your talent. So I wanted to preserve it and make sure that nothing happened to it. So as soon as you left, I hid it, hid the money under the mattress, and it's been there the whole time, and it's safe and sound, and here is your talent that you gave me back, unused, but safe and sound. The master goes ballistic. He absolutely goes ballistic. Get out of here. You are the worst servant I've ever had. I'm casting you out. Get out of here. Now, many New Testament scholars say it's important to understand the point of this parable. The point of this parable is not about investing money. The point of this parable is, are we willing to risk in engagement with our world what God has given to us? Many New Testament scholars say if the first two servants had lost all their money but had risked engagement with the world, the master would have said, okay. What the master was concerned about and what caused him to go ballistic was that the third servant just hid what had been given. He believed that if he just held on, 
he just played it safe, everything would be all right. Jesus wants you to know, and remember Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, taking a few risks himself. Jesus wants you to know that people of faith are called to use the talents that they've been given, risking in relation to the world in which they live. And Jesus wants you to know that you individually and collectively will be held responsible for the stewardship of those talents. This Sunday, the master returns and says not only to the three servants, but to each of us, what have you done? What have you done with the talents that I entrusted to you? The late Pope John XXIII often said that the role of the church was not to preserve a museum, the role of the church was to create a flourishing garden of life. The role of the church is not to preserve a museum. The role of the church is to create a flourishing garden of life. And if you're going to create a flourishing garden of life, you have to use the talents that you've been given and take a few risks. I believe that if we are faithful to what Christ has called us, there are three risks that we will always, individually and collectively, be willing to take. Number one, I think we will always be willing to risk our resources. Particularly, particularly willing to risk them in relation to those who are in most need of what we have. In the year 2000, a declaration called the Millennium Declaration was signed by all the developed nations, mostly, including us, the U.S. And that declaration acknowledged that we had the resources to, within 15 years, cut in half world poverty we could cut the number of children who die daily in half from about 1,000 to 500. We could do that. We could cut the number of young girls who had no formal education. We could cut that number in half. Very quickly, all the churches, the major churches, signed on. The 74th General Convention of the Episcopal Church said our number one priority was the Millennium Development Goals. Now what you had to do to reach these goals was you had to be willing, and I want you to pay close attention to this number, you had to be willing to give 0.07% of your national budget to the alleviation of rural poverty, to the alleviation of death. Governments were asked to do that. Churches pledged to do that. Whenever I go into churches, particularly Episcopal churches, I always look in their literature rack to see how much information they have about the Millennium Development Goal. We said that was our number one priority. I'm glad to report that you do have some literature about the Millennium Development Goals. A little booklet, what one person can do 
very important. We only have two copies left. You should have several hundred out there, though, and you should be reading them. Because by and large, once we pass the resolution, we stop doing anything. Thirty years ago, a study was done. A study was done of the Episcopal Church, which pointed out that if at that moment every member of the Episcopal Church went on welfare, and that was their total income, and they tithed that income, our national budget would increase threefold. We are a lot like the third servant. We like to hold on and not risk. Hold on and not risk. Second risk you have to be willing to take is to hear the truth and be willing to speak the truth. The novelist Flannery O'Connor said, the truth shall make you free. But first, it will make you miserable. Made my uncle miserable. He didn't want to die of lung cancer, but he didn't want to stop smoking. So he was pretty miserable. You need to hear the truth. You need to hear the truth about the world in which you live, how you use your resources, what you can do as a human being, to help bring the reign of God closer to reality. You need to hear that truth, but you also need to speak it. And if you are not confronted with truths that make you feel miserable from time to time, then you are hanging out with the wrong people. My seminary library, the Virginia Theological Seminary, there was a motto in carved, engraved in stone over the entrance of the library. M motto I saw every day of my life. It said, seek you the truth, come whence it may, cost what it will. The third risk that we must be willing to take is that we must be willing to risk, and this third risk is related to the first and second. Third risk is that we must take every risk we know how to take to make sure that most human beings can live as human beings. That most children do not die of starvation. We must be willing to take the risk to be sure that all young girls, no matter where they live, are taught to read and write. We must be willing to take the risk that the air in which we, the air which we breathe remains breathable. The master said to the servants, how have you used my resources? We must remember that we stand always in the presence of God. And the word of God, as is spoken in scripture, calls our very lives into question. But we know that the God who calls us to be accountable. It's the God who in Jesus the Christ gives his life for us. Is the God who stands willing to forgive our sins. The God who is able to transform our present reality. And the God who will lead us into a future where we shall hear the word, well done, good and faithful servant. But we must remember 
In the words of the Afro-American spiritual, that if we are moving to a day where all God's children are going to be walking around heaven because all God's children are going to have shoes, then we want to make sure that we can do as much as possible right now to make sure that on our way to that day, as many of God's children as we know have shoes right now. Because what we want is for the kingdom to come on earth as in heaven. Let there be peace among us, and let us never be instruments of our own or anyone else's oppression.